What a day! A pre Shiloh encounter service, an impartation service. Lift up your hand and give him thanks for bringing you here this morning. Give him praise and give him glory. Thank him and thank him and thank him and glorify him. Is God did all he can and brought you here this morning. Thank him for bringing you here to be blessed, to be multiplied, to be increased, to be fruitful, to be favored. Give him praise this morning in the name of Jesus. I'm sure you have your prayer rich card with you this morning. I'd like you to bring it forth. God has not stopped answering prayer. God has answered many and is still answering right now. Is in the business of meeting us at the point of our needs. And to this morning, is meeting you at the point of your need. In Psalms 86 and verse 17. Psalm 86 and verse 17. It says, show me a token of good. That they that hate me may see it and be ashamed. Because thou, O Lord, has helped me and comforted me. I'd like you to turn into a prayer this morning. Lord, this week... By this request, show me a token of your good. Show me a token that you are a prayer answering God. Show me a token of a pre Shiloh encounter answers. Show me a token this morning. You show the children of Israel a token. And one night, they came out of the land of Egypt. Lord, show me a token this morning. Is that man lifting up his voice to God? Is that woman lifting up his voice to God? Lord, show me a token for good. Show me a token for good. A token for my favor. A token for my employment. A token for the desire increase. Show me a token for good this morning. Lift your voice to him. He's hearing you already. He's answering your prayer already. He's doing what you cannot do for yourself. Blessed be your name. In Jesus' mighty name. We have prayed. The Bible says, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above what we ask or even imagine. Beyond your imagination, I see answer coming for you. Whatever you have asked him this morning, by this time next Sunday, is already in your hand as a testimony. Whatever is said to be difficult and impossible, whatever is not available, because your God is the creator of all, is created for you this week in the name of Jesus. Somebody is here this morning and saying, where will I ever share my testimony? This week will be your own week in the name of Jesus. Father, we give him praise, we to him and give him thanks in our anticipation. Give him thanks and give him glory. Bless his name forever. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Someone that's excited, please put your hands together for the king as you have your seat. Once again this morning, you are welcome to God's presence. The appointment with God is the greatest appointment on the earth. You are before the king of kings. The father of all father, the source of all source, the creator of all creature. And this morning, because you have appeared before him, your case will not be revered. Whatever may be your desire, I see it granted in the name of Jesus. I'd like to thank my father, God's servant, for this privilege in bringing your word, the word of God to you this morning. We had every uh, powerful word in the first service, uh, second service, and... That word brought about supernatural impartation upon us. This morning, standing on the existing grace here, I see the same grace answer for you in the name of Jesus. The impartation you are going to receive this morning, as the word after the word this morning, will bring about a change of experience in your life. Every impartation takes you away from something and brings you to something. It takes you away from shame and brings you to honor. The impartation coming your way this morning is an impartation of honor. In 2 Kings chapter number 2, from verse 8 to verse 15. 2 Kings 
chapter 2, verse 8 to verse 15, the Bible says, Elijah went with Elijah. And when he received the impartation, the, the graces he received from his Elijah, he remained, his Elijah remained upon him. And everything that answered for Elijah answered for Elisha. Favor answered for him. The, the, the Jordan opened for him. The authority answered for him. The same grace upon his servant this morning is answering for somebody in this service this morning. I'm not sure that person heard me very well. I had a testimony of replication of grace. Impartation is about replication of grace. We had a testimony of our father, Bishop David Reko. Uh, some unbanded went into the house. And when they got into the house, the head of the team that's, that went there to rob, hearing the tape playing, his message was playing. And he told his colleagues, he said, don't touch anything in this house. And he ordered, please let me have a CD. Let me have the tape. So the only thing that was stolen or that was taken was the tape. And the following day, he returned. He said, I was the robber last night. I, I need more of those tapes. Now, I saw the duplication of the same from my father also. Somebody took his tape and was playing it in his car. And that car was stolen. And while they were driving the car that was stolen, he began to hear the word, you better repent now. You better turn now. And they drove into a police station to hand over the car and hand over themselves. Now hear me. Whatever you have seen in God's servant, whatever you have seen in this commission, the same is returning from you with you this morning. Yeah. If you believe that, let me hear your greater amen. Yeah. We are looking at understanding the wonders of godliness. Understanding the wonders of godliness. If you like, understanding the reward of godliness, the blessings of godliness, the benefit of godliness. In Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 19, he said, I have not called the seed of Jacob to seek me in vain. So godliness is for gain. There is gain now and ever. There is gain, an eternal gain in godliness. Gain. You can't walk in godliness and stand on the losing lane. The godly way is a highway to blessing. The godly way is a highway to lasting peace. The godly way is the way to everything you can see in the hands of God. Everything God has is accessible to the godly. He said he has given us all things that pertains to life and godliness through the knowledge of him. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 3. He has given us all things. So by godliness you assess every good. Every good thing. Call it favor. Call it promotion. Call it increase. Every good thing in God is available to the godly. It doesn't matter who is mocking you now for being godly. It doesn't matter who is not respecting you or giving you your right place. But godliness pays. Godliness is gain. In fact, ungodliness is the losing way. Or godliness is the losing lane. When you walk in ungodly, you lose everything. You lose everything. You go on a minus lane. One day after his master has torn his wages several times, Jacob said, my righteousness will speak for me. Genesis chapter 30, verse 33. My righteousness will speak for me. Genesis chapter 30 and verse 30. Say, my righteousness will speak for me. And what he could not get for upward of 20 years, when righteousness began to speak, he got it in one year. In that same Genesis chapter 30, verse 43. In verse 43, the Bible says, And the man, Jacob, increased exceedingly. Is he talking about somebody here this morning? Exceedingly, and had much cattle, and may servant, and may servant, and camel, and asses. 
whatever level you are in right now, I don't know who has gone ahead of you. Godliness will fast forward you. By godliness, you will overtake them. I'm not sure somebody heard me very well. One day, David was wondering, I have seen ungodly people prosper. I have seen ungodly people build houses. I have seen ungodly people, they are in a lot of comfort. And David was so concerned. He, are you sure that godliness profits? In Psalms chapter 30, Psalms chapter 73 and verse 12. Psalms 73 and verse 12. It says, Behold, these are ungodly who, are, who prosper in the earth and increase. I am bothered. Then the Bible says, in verse 15 to verse 17, And he went into the house of the Lord and saw their end. He said, They have been set in slippery places. Whatever you see around the ungodly is just camouflage. Whatever you see around the ungodly is so tempera. It says they will just melt away and slip away. But righteousness endures forever. By godliness, I see you enduring in the name of Jesus. What is godliness? Godliness is not a state of perfection. Rather, it is a state of moving towards perfection. It is not a state of perfection. Rather, it is a state of moving towards perfection. Philippians chapter number 3 and verse 10 to verse number 14. Philippians chapter 3 from verse 10 to verse 14. Paul was speaking. He said, I don't see myself as perfect. He said, but one thing I do, I put every other thing behind. I move towards perfection. I move towards the mark of my high calling. So it is a longing and a desire for God. Godliness is a continuous longing and desire for God. Godliness is going away from everything that is ungodly and going fully for everything that makes for godliness, that makes for righteousness, that makes for purity, that makes for truth, that makes for honesty. That is godliness. Godliness is not staying in our righteousness, as it were. It is moving towards God's perfection. It is moving towards what God has made available for us. The Bible says in 1 John chapter number 3, verse 5 and verse 6, it says, and ye know that he, was, that he was made manifested to take away our sin. And in him is no sin. Verse number. It says, whosoever abided, in, whosoever abided in him sinned not. Whosoever sinned has not known him, neither knoweth him. Has not seen him, neither knoweth him. Verse 7. It says, little children. Let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteously is righteous. Say with me, doeth righteously. Righteously is doable. Even as is righteous. Now look at verse 8. For this purpose, the Son of Man, he said he that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of Man was made manifest. That he might destroy the works of the devil. Now look at verse 9. Verse 9 now says, Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. That means does not enjoy staying with sin. Does not collaborate with sin. Does he hate sin? He runs away from sin. He says, Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. And he that committed sin is not born of God. If you are born of God, let me hear your amen. amen. What does that mean? When you are born again, there is a seed, if you like, there is a nature of godliness inside of you. When you are born again, there is the purity 
and the nature of God, God's God inside of you that is implanted. And by that nature, you have the power, you have the appetite, you have the ability and the potential to live a godly life. That's why Paul said in Acts chapter 24 and verse 16. Acts 24 and verse 16. He says, herein do I exercise myself. So you can exercise yourself to godliness. You can exercise yourself because you have the seed. If you have the seed this morning, let me hear your amen. amen. Say it again. Say a good amen. amen. You have the seed. You have what it takes to live godly. A child of God has the nature of God. By redemption, you have the seed in you. So what God does God expect of us? To exercise ourselves. To exercise ourselves and move towards righteousness. And move towards loving God. And to move towards staying with God. Unrighteousness is a robber. Sin is a killer. Sin is a destroyer. In Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, it says, All have sinned and have come short of the glory of God. Sin takes away glory. It takes away dignity. It takes away blessing. It takes away honor. Until Adam sinned, Adam was not losing. Until Adam sinned, Adam never was displaced. Sin displaces any individual. That's why we must exercise ourselves. We must fight. There is a battle. We must fight to walk in godliness by the seed of God that is in us. There is a seed in you to tell the truth. There is a seed in me and you to love the things of God. There is a seed. It is our responsibility. It is your responsibility to exercise that seed. That's why the Bible says, walk out your salvation with fear and trembling. You can walk out the things that makes for godliness. I see the grace for godly living walking upon everyone in the name of Jesus. The enemy, we want a believer to stay in ungodliness so as to rob him of these three major things. When a believer is in sin, he cannot be helped by God. In that scripture in Isaiah chapter 50, uh, 9 verse 1 and 2, it says, it's not that the Lord can't help you. And you see, no matter how strong you think you are, you will always need help. So he puts sin. When sin is at work, help is obey. Help is far. Number two, why does the enemy put, wants the believer to stay in unrighteousness? He wants you to stay in unrighteousness to lose God's presence. Jesus said something. In John chapter 8 and verse 29, he said, My father has never left me alone because I always do that which pleases him. Righteousness, godliness pleases God. But unrighteousness breaks you away from your link and the presence of God. Now, when you have God's presence, you command every goodness that God carries. That's why the enemy is fighting. And number three, the enemy is doing everything to put a believer in unrighteousness so as to lose his possession. There are, is a, there are position and possession God has blessed you with. But when one stands in unrighteousness and refuses to turn and refuses to return to God, you lose those things with your eyes open. But this morning, whatever the enemy is doing through unrighteousness in any life, I say a restoration in the name of Jesus. Let me say this. By redemption, you do not only have the nature. There are three major indicators that helps you to live in godliness. One, the moment you give your life to Christ, it is the greatest miracle. Salvation is the greatest miracle. Now, if you are talking about miracle, 
if that you, that, that's what we think Jesus came to do, Jesus did not, he came to do miracles quite okay, but majorly he came to save man from sin. There is raising of the dead in the Old Testament. There's opening of the blind from the Old Testament. There's crossing of the Red Sea in the Old Testament. All the miracles you can think about that Jesus ever did, he did the same. Jesus fed 5,000. Je- Moses fed 3 million. 3 million people were eating every day. So every miracle you can see, it, it was done in the Old Testament. But the greatest miracle Jesus came to do is to deliver man from sin. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21. It says, and it shall save his people from their sin. And by that miracle, you experience these three factors. One, you receive peace. Two, there is a love of God in you. There is a love of God in you. Three, there is joy. That's why when David sinned, in Psalms chapter number 51, from verse 8 to verse 11, He said, take not away the joy of my salvation. Every time you stay in godliness, joy overflows. Peace overflows. Your love for God is triggered. But every time a believer is is going away, you begin to notice, they begin to beg him to read the Bible. They begin to beg him to go to church. The things of God are tiresome to him. But this morning, there is restoration for somebody here. I'm not hearing your amen very well. Every plan of the wicked over you and over your destiny to loan you to unrighteousness. By the grace and the seed of God in you, you are an overcomer in the name of Jesus. What is the nature of sin? What is the nature of sin? In James chapter 1 and verse 13, we need to know, if you don't know a thing very well, you may not know how to handle it. If you don't know an enemy very well, you may not know how to overcome it. What is the nature? What is the character of sin? The worst thing that can happen is to be in a battlefield and you are not sure you are in the battle. When you are in the battlefield and you are not conscious of the battle, the person becomes a victim. That's why the Bible says in that scripture, in 2 Timothy chapter number 2, verse 3 and 4, it says, be like a soldier. And it says, who endure all good, good things as a true soldier. It says, who is he that worried and entangled himself with the affairs of this world? So when you are not conscious, I have, you see, when you see soldiers, you discover that the moment a soldier wears the uniform, his face change. The moment a soldier wears his uniform, it's not the friend you used to shake and and play with anyhow. Everything about him changes. The same posture we must carry in order to conquer sin. I was told of a story during the Second World War. There was a teenager that was in the war, about 16 years old. And they were in the trench and they were firing against the adversary. But because... He was a teenager and he forgot the consciousness that he is a soldier. A butterfly landed on his rifle. And he began to play like a teenager and going after the butterfly, forgetting that he was on the battlefield. Before he touched the butterfly, the bullet knocked him. Why? Because he was not focused. But this morning, the soldier spirit that makes for more than a conqueror I say rest upon each one in the name of Jesus. Number one, nature of sin, we must understand that sin is enticing. Sin is enticing. Sin loin, another word for enticing is to loin people. It looks good. It's quoted as as being good, but there's every evil behind it. It's quoted as being good, but there's every evil behind it. And that. James chapter 1, from verse 13. It says from verse 13 to verse 15, that let no man, when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot tempt with evil, neither tempt he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away. 
away of his own lusts and enticed. Now, when you want to catch a fish, you put a bait, maybe uh, an insect or a worm. And you throw the hook into the, wa into the water. Now, if fishes are moving and they are not seeing it, you keep shaking it so that they can see it. And that's what the enemy does. He comes again and again to entice you into covetousness. Say, you don't have any money. Can't you join these ungodly people and have, so that you can have money for a season? He comes to tell you, look, if the way your body is moving you, satisfy the desire of your body. Now, if you look at advertising, you wonder why they advertise in advertising industry. They bring a picture to you in one hour, seven times. One of the things they do is to entice you, to make the picture come in your heart. The moment it hits your heart, you, are already, you have already caught the image. This morning, whatever the enemy is doing to entice anyone, I see it ended in the name of Jesus. We looked at in the first service concerning Samson. In the book of Judges chapter 16, verse 5 and verse 6, the Lord of the Philistines, they sent the enticing woman to Samson. Again and again, show us the way of your power. And they keep the, day, the first day, the second day, just to keep presenting what is not true to be true. There are so many today in church, they walk by the standard of people that are falling, not by the standard of what the word of God says. You say, well, after all, that person is very active in church. He's doing it, so why, why am I not? What stops me? It takes the standard of people, not the standard of God. The Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. In Romans chapter 1, and verse 28, it said, because they do not retain God in their mind. It said, God gave them over to a reprobate mind so that they will not do things that are convenient. Verse 29, it began to list those things that entices. It says, be filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debating. They can, they can argue on any scriptural truth. Debating, whisperers, and all that. This morning, every walk of enticing in the life of anyone, I see it destroyed in the name of Jesus. Somebody is always sending money to your account, and you know that his plan is evil. Man or woman, his plan is evil. You say, no, don't worry, don't worry, just don't worry, don't worry. You see, every relationship that cannot be defined is will lead into trouble. He's married or she's married, but it takes you very specially. Yet, you are not asking questions. It is an enticement. In Genesis chapter 39, verse 10 to 12. Genesis 39, 10 to 12. That woman, the Bible says, she came to Joseph. Day by day. First day, it may bring food. Another day, it may bring very big bush meat. Another day, it may bring a packet of money. But was doing everything. But David, Joseph was looking straight. When Joseph refused all this, he said, look, now look at me face to face. The Bible says, and he fled. This morning, whatever is contending with your attention to keep you down, Today, I see the grace to escape in the name of Jesus. Number two, nature of sin is secretive. Sin is secretive. Sin is secretive. Sin is secretive. The Bible says the eye of the Lord goes to and fro upon the earth. His eyes are everywhere, beholding good and evil. God sees everything. The great man, the man of God, T.L. Osborne said, every secret sin on the earth is an open scandal in heaven. 
If you read Hebrews chapter 12, from verse 3, it says, we are surrounded with clouds of weaknesses. So, when you are taking wrong steps, Moses is looking from heaven. Where you think that nobody sees, God sees. He feels all things in all. In Psalms 139, verse 12, down to verse 19. David said, I went to the hill, you are there. I hid myself, you are there. There is no way you can hide that God is not. Sin is secretive. You know, there's something you are doing that you don't want anyone to see. And the way out of sin is to expose it. The way out of sin is to expose it. Until it is exposed, you don't overcome it. The way out of sin is to expose it. This call that keeps coming from a different woman, which is not your wife. Hand over the phone to your wife. Honey, this call has been coming and is always coming at this time. Answer it. Somebody knows he will not accept a visit in your house, but he wants to visit in your office. And he visits you at a particular time. If you know that you need to overcome, bring your wife in. This person and this intention must be overcome. Whatever is the force standing as a secret that has been hidden, I see it destroyed this morning in the name of Jesus. There's nothing hidden before God. And the devil will keep telling you lies. It is hidden. Nobody knows. You are the only one that knows. You are the only one that knows. Let me tell you this. Your shadow is counting it. Everything around you is counting it. Everything is taking note. This morning, every walk of secret that is of unrighteousness, I see busted this morning in the name of Jesus. You see the account of David in 2 Samuel chapter number 11 and verse 1. 2 Samuel chapter 11 and verse 1. David, at the time of war, he was at home. And because he was not at the right place, he went and was loyal to the wife of Uriah and lay with another man's wife. He did not stop there. If you go to chapter 12, verse 12. After he was discovered, he felt it was secret. You know, the deceit of the devil is this. It will make you to feel that, look, you can hide this. The more you stay in sin, the more you multiply the sin. It starts with maybe a lie. From a lie to immorality, from immorality to so many, many, many more things. If sin is not exposed, it multiplies. That's why I say, he that covereth sin shall not prosper. But he that confess and forsake shall obtain mercy. Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 13. This morning, mercy is coming for somebody here. I'm not sure I heard it very well. All that David did in secret, God use Nathan to say, look, it was not secret. It was exposed. So every secret deal, every secret change of figure, every secret dealing that is not of God, that will not make you to glorify God is ended this morning in the name of Jesus. As we try to round up, how do I break the trap of sin? How do I break the trap of sin? One, by the spirit of obedience. By the spirit of obedience. In Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 27. There is a spirit of disobedience that rules among the, un the ungodly. But when you are born again, he said, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my status. And ye shall keep my judgment and do them. You, when that spirit comes on you, doing the things of God, loving the things of God, becomes joyful. You are excited to tell the truth. The day I was a small boy in school and I saw in my Bible, I saw uh, John chapter 8 verse 44. You know what it says there? It says, he that tells us that the devil is a liar from the beginning and in him there is no truth at all. The, in, the, in the NIV version, it says, he that speaketh a lie, the devil is his father. When I saw that, it was a very serious matter. I had a meeting with all that were around me. 
I said, from now, there is no joking lie. Every word is truth. Every word is yea and amen. This morning, the spirit of obedience, I say, rest upon everyone in the name of Jesus. Willingness to obey. Willingness to do whatever God says you should do. That company you are keeping, that is not of God. Willing, he said, depart from it. Go away from it and touch not the unclean things. Willingness to respond. There's somebody in this service this morning. The place you used to go, they will find you that you are no more coming there. I said they will look for you and they will not find you. Something happened sometime in one of the foreign nations where I'm privileged to be. A woman came for counseling and she, she complained that, look, my husband does not come home on time. They are all members of the church. She said, doesn't come home on time. So the man was summoned. That, Why don't you come home on time? You stay at, after work, you stay out till 11. In that country, they like to take pork and take drinks. That, he said he likes taking pork. He said, what do you like in pork that your wife cannot cook for you? Now, the man said, well, he was too stubborn. But listen, in that country, one of the major challenges they have is HIV. In a short while, the woman began to see the traces of HIV in her. And when the man was called for both of them to go for tests, the man was negative. Sorry, the man was negative, the woman was positive. The man packed his things out of the house. I said, well, he cannot stay with a woman that is positive. Now, the truth was, it was this woman. But listen to me. It may not be seen now, it will be seen later. Whatever you need to turn from by obedience, I see you turning from the same in the name of Jesus. Number two, engage in the spirit of love for God. Love for God. In 1 John chapter, chapter 2, verse 15, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. It says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For in the world, he that loveth the world, the love of the Father is not in him. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, it says, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4, it says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. So you cannot overcome the things you stay with. Love not the way they lie. Love not the way they change figure. Love not the way they go into immorality. Don't envy them. Don't applaud them. If in your office, somebody is waiting for you on Monday morning, and the first thing he wants to tell you is, excuse me, you know where I went to last night? You know where I went, where I spent my weekend? I was just going about. I'm telling you all manner of sin is committing. No. You must make your stand known and let the world know who you stand for. Your love for God should be demonstrated by the way you speak, by the things you represent. This morning, I see your love for God standing strong in the name of Jesus. Number three, be open. Be open. First Samuel chapter 12, verse 3. Be open. Don't be a, a secretive person. There are people today that their wife cannot even enter their room. There are some files they can, nobody can see it. Everything is being hidden. Be open. You are going somewhere, nobody knows where you are going. Be open. Be open in your relationship. Be open in your conduct. Be open. Number four, examine yourself. First Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12. Examine yourself. Every day, place yourself on the check. I had a teacher, a geography teacher, while we were in school. The husband is a reverend in the Anglican church. Now, for eight years, she has been believing God for the fruit of the womb. And we as little children in school, Zelios, born again, we were praying for her heavily. Lord, our geography teacher must be pregnant, must be fruitful. And we kept praying. Now, one of the days while we were praying, there was a word of knowledge that came. Let her forgive mother-in-law. So we went, that you have not forgiven, there's somebody you have not forgiven. And she started crying. She said, my mother-in-law, when she takes my water, it's like she's taking my blood. 
Now, she went and forgave that mother-in-law and did what she needed to do. That same month, she conceived. She gave birth to a son, I still remember, the name is Jimmy. And three other children came. Whatever is holding you back from receiving your blessing, I see it broken this morning in the name of Jesus. So don't sit in church and begin to point at somebody. There are most times when message is going on, someone say, I wish, I hope that man is around. I hope that woman is around. Examine yourself. And number five, keep good company. Keep righteous company. Keep righteous company. In Psalms chapter 1, from verse 1 to verse 3, blessed is the man that walk not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, nor walk in the way of sinners. But this is his delight, is in the law of the law, and in it does he meditate day and night. This man, he will prosper in all his ways. Identify with right company. The company you keep determines your outcome of your life and destiny. Keep company with the righteous. Keep right company is a way to overcome the devices of the wicked. Now, what are the benefits of what are the benefits of godliness? Number one, peace. You can't buy peace. The United Nations is spending so much money on peace. You can't buy it. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Your Father is the giver of peace. Peace. And when you are not in righteousness, there is no peace. The Bible says, there is no peace for the wicked. Isaiah chapter 48, verse 22. There is no peace for the wicked. There is no peace for the wicked. The way to have peace is to receive in your heart the Prince of Peace and walk in godliness. Number two, benefit of godliness is boldness and confidence. Boldness and confidence. In Proverbs 28, verse 1, it says the righteous... The righteous, the, he said, the wicked, the wicked flee when no man it. But the righteous is as bold as lion. His confidence is strong. He's, he can stand anyone. Confidence. So many are in high position, but their confidence has been eroded because of unrighteousness. This morning, the blessing of godliness answers for you in the name of Jesus. Number three is speedy answer to prayer. There is speed when you pray. God answers you as he answers his children. Speedy answers to prayer. Psalm 66 and verse 18. Psalm 66 verse 18. Proverbs chapter number 15 and verse 7. It says the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. It says, but... The prayer of the righteous, verse 8. The prayer of the righteous is attentive to it. The prayer of the righteous is his delight. When the righteous pray, God gives answer. Number four, honor. Honor is coming for you this morning. I say honor is coming for you this morning. In First Samuel chapter 9 and verse 6, honor, honor. You become a man of honor. It was said about Samuel, he was an honorable man. And honorable man. Finally, what does godliness do? It gives you a reputation. It gives you a reputation. There was one politician in this country, it's late now. When he wants to employ his accountant, what does he do? He looks for born again Christian. Those days, not now. He looks for born again Christian. Why? Because he said, born again Christian will not steal my money, born again Christian will keep it. That's why the Bible says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify God in heaven. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16. It gives you goodwill. Now let me say this to you as we round up. I don't believe that the master of Joseph agreed that Joseph was going after his wife. How? Even though he had to respond as the number three man in the nation by putting Joseph in the prison. Joseph had goodwill with his master. If you read Genesis chapter 39, verse 3, 4, and 5, he had goodwill that if Joseph was a slave. He can kill him if he wanted to kill him. He's the head of the defense. He did not kill him. To show you that Joseph had a goodwill and he knew that Joseph was a godly man, the Bible says Joseph was put in the prison of 
executives in the prison of the king. That is where you put executive prisoners. There's television there. There's everything they need to have. They have their own maid that watches for them. How will they do that? How will they commit adultery with a man's wife? And he puts him there. It's to tell you that the man never believed his wife. He just put that boy there just to fulfill all righteousness. But all the same, when the time came, when the time came, godliness brought Joseph. Genesis chapter 41 and verse 38 to 44. Genesis 41, 38 to 44. Joseph appeared before Pharaoh and he became a master over his master. He became a master over his accuser. This morning, godliness will answer for you. I'm not sure that person heard me very well. If you are in the godly team, let me hear your amen. Now this morning, I'd like you to make a decision. You're, I was somewhere yesterday preaching, and I tell them that, I say, look, the greatest asset you have in life is when you are alive. I have been to many funerals, and I see a person lying down. And people say all manner of good things. Say, that person is very good. That person is too wonderful. That person, you are just telling stories. Your choice where, while you are alive determines your eternal destination. Don't allow this hour to be late. I'd like to give that man and that woman this singular privilege of your life. You have heard the word, perhaps from different places. You have heard the word again this morning. And the Holy Ghost is speaking to you. You need to change. You need to live where you used to be and be on God's side. The power and the nature of God to stand in righteousness is, in, is released when you give your life to Jesus as a child of God. This morning, somebody wants to stand up for Jesus. He wants to stand up unashamedly. That look, I am for Jesus. I am for the truth. I damn Satan. I damn sin. I damn unrighteousness. I go for God this morning. That man, that woman, that is making a decision for Jesus and for godliness, rise your feet wherever you are. Come on, clap for that man. Come on, clap for that woman. Clap for that man. Clap for that woman. Clap for that man. Clap for that woman. Somebody else is still standing. You are the only one we are waiting for. Somebody else is still standing. You are casting your vote for Jesus this morning. You are casting your vote for Jesus. You are not on the losing team anymore. You are for Jesus this morning. He came to give you the greatest gift. The greatest miracle is to have God on your inside. That is what happens when you give your life to Jesus. That man and that woman, you are rising to your feet this morning. Now, somebody is still here. You used to be born again. Perhaps you are even a member of the church. Everybody knows you with an emblem. And you are saying, well, I can manage it. And you have been managing it all this while. It is the deceit of the devil to look for how to corner and kill you. I want to give you that privilege, singular privilege to escape for your life this morning. That man and that woman, you like to join this precious one. Come on, stand up for Jesus this morning. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Everyone that is standing for Jesus, pick your Bible, pick your Bible, and run, 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 run to the place of your rescue. The altar. Jesus' hands are wide open this morning. He's here to receive you. He said, even though your sin be as scarlet, it shall be as white as snow. He's ready to save. He's ready to deliver. Jesus wants to save you this morning. He wants to cleanse you. He wants to put his seed, his nature inside of you. Somebody is joining this winning kid team this morning. Somebody is registering for Jesus this morning. Somebody wants to be a citizen of heaven this morning. Come on. Clap for them. I see that person from the back there. Somebody is just standing up. Somebody is about to stand up. Rise your feet. Run up here. This is your hour of deliverance. It's your hour of rescue. It's your hour of salvation. Wherever you are, run up here. It's your hour of change. Something is about to happen. The greatest miracle is about to take place in your life. That person that is still waiting, I want you to run up here in the next five minutes, in the next count of five. This is your hour. The Holy Ghost is still speaking. You are still sitting down there and you cannot afford to deceive yourself. Jesus will not condemn you. Everybody may have condemned you. You may have condemned yourself. After this count of fire, run up here. One, two, three, 
fall. Come on, run up here. Now everyone in front, I can see them running, coming. Everyone in front, please hold on with what you're writing. I'd like you to lift up your right hand as I lead you to Jesus, the Savior, and the miracle of salvation will take place in your life this morning. Now say with me, Lord Jesus, today I recognize you as my Lord and my Savior. Save me, deliver me from all unrighteousness, cleanse me by your blood. Write my name in the book of life. From today, I make up my mind to live for you now and unto eternity. Thank you, Jesus, for giving me the same grace. In Jesus' mighty name. Now, let me pray for you. Father, the grace that brought these ones, let the same grace, grace keep them. Every trail of Satan and wickedness over this destiny is canceled right now. In Jesus' mighty name.